Okay, now, 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 it's your turn. Um, any questions about anything we talked about today or today's Torah portion? I want to talk about Nephilim or something like that. Yes, Jennifer. Um, Peter actually wondered that because the Bible says, uh, Peter said that uh, after it happened, she was asking, was he testing him? What's interesting, what, what was powerful for me the first time I really recognized what was going on there, because I came from a background where I said, okay, I heard a guy, Robinson, I'll leave it at that, you figure out which one it is. He lives in Louisiana and he makes duck calls, but anyway, he's a good preacher. And he's like, Lord put that sheet down in front of Peter and it had all them animals in it. He said, eat it. I eat it. <laughs> but what did Peter say? Think about this. The voice of God comes to Peter says, arise Peter and kill it. He said, no. No, not so, no. No. Arise Peter. And he's like, he's, and he says, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And, and God replies, don't call anything I've cleansed common. It happened again. And it happened again. Three times God says to Peter, rise, kill it, eat it. And three times Peter said to God, no. And he's still standing. Don't say anything about he fell down on his face or nothing. He stood in God's face and said no. Now I realize it's the Spirit speaking. But this isn't a whole lot different when you think of the faith of Abraham. That God shows up at Abraham and he says, I'm going to make your, I'm going to give you all these Children like Sarah and God said, and, and Abraham says to God, how do I know that's going to happen? And God didn't slap him. He said, come on, I'll show you. So he challenges us, but with Peter, it's not what it looked like. I mean, Peter, I mean, here's my question. What's Peter standing on to tell God no? He knows God doesn't change, and he knows God doesn't lie. And so at the end of that thing, it says, and Peter pondered the vision. He's like, what was that? Because he knew without question. I know he's not telling me to eat that. What is he telling me? I mean, he said, and while he pondered the vision, the Holy Spirit came to him again and said, there's three men coming. I sent them. Go down there. Don't doubt it. Just go. Do it. And he goes down there. It's three Romans, which according to their tradition... Shouldn't be in his house. He shouldn't be talking to him. He shouldn't be having this conversation with him. And that's when he got it. He said, ah, I see what he's saying now. Because when God cleanses somebody, meaning spiritually cleansed, it's not, about, it's not about our DNA. It's not about where we're born. It's not about who our parents are. It's about who our Abba is. Amen? That's what makes us children of God. You know? So, yeah. So, it really... It really it was almost a parable in a vision, but Peter was strong enough to know that, that God doesn't go against his word. Yes? Could you explain uh, Deuteronomy 12, verses 15 and 22? I'll try. I'll try. Let me see. Okay, absolutely. Okay, so let's back up. Um, it's talking about offerings, first of all. Um, when I had a verse, because a lot of this is talking about offering, so I'll, maybe I'll get to that verse too. Maybe that's what I'm supposed to be doing here. You shall rejoice. So, so what happens here in, in chapter 12, this is where we're introduced to the idea of one altar. It's titled, one, you know, God chooses a place of worship. worship. Up until this point, it was pretty much wherever Israel was as they traveled through the wilderness, as they come to Sinai, wherever they are, they built altars along the way, along the journey. They built altars. And so now, standing here about to go into the promised land, he's like, well, now, we, now when we get here, there's going to be a place where I put my name. In other words, this is, we're going to have one place. This is the first time they see the, the idea of that. Of course, they had to make their way there, which took a while. And they had other altars until they got there. But once they got the altar in Jerusalem and started working, that was it. No more altars anywhere else after that. Okay, so that was, that was what he's telling them about. So he's talking about sacrifices. And he's talking about the feast and how you do it. And he's like, um, tell me what, verse 15? Did you say 15, verse 15? Okay. 15 and 22. Okay, help me remember this because I'm going to talk as I go down. I'm going to teach this whole verse in 30 seconds. Um, 
And so we see there in 6, it's like, so you shall bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, the tithes, heave, all of this, you bring it, and there you shall eat it. Verse 7, that's where you're going to eat it, this place, this one place. Don't, don't do after the things, and this is real key, verse 8. This is, this is not new either. We've had the same problem today. And he said, you shall not do after the things that they do this day where every man is doing what's right in his own eyes. I'm going to shift versions on you. A little easier for me to read. If I got tongue tied up here, I might choke. <clears throat> so you haven't yet come to the rest. You're not there yet. You're on this journey, okay? Um, and so he says, he, he, um, but when you go over the Jordan, you know, uh, you're going to have rest. You're going to go to the place where Yahweh chooses, verse 11. And you shall rejoice before Yahweh there. That's his whole point. And the Levite within your gate because he has no portion. You know, don't just offer offerings any place that you are. So he said, don't do that. But in the place Yahweh chooses out of one of the tribes, it's going to be there. That's where you're going to do everything that I tell you to do. Verse 15, nevertheless, you may kill and eat meat within your gates at your house on your land. Okay. After all that you want to eat, according to Yahweh's blessing that he's given you, the unclean person may eat of it. Okay. And like a gazelle and as a deer. Okay, so he's saying another word. And here's the difference. Because when you kill one for the, for the uh, sacrifice in Jerusalem, the unclean person cannot have it. So he's saying, and he tells us a difference. And here's the key, key, key difference between. And, and same thing with the, when you get to the Passover. And maybe that's what's the next one. I don't know. When he talks about the Passover offerings, the same thing. He said, but you can't do it in the, in the place that I give you. But look, here's the difference. Verse 16. This is the difference between, man, this looks really print. I hope y'all can see better than me. It's at the top, I think. Yeah, it's at the top. Um, only the blood is what makes the difference between just killing an animal to eat and whether it's a sacrifice. He says, don't eat the blood. You shall, which is always the case. You never eat the blood. But pour it out like water. We get in trouble when, you know, and I get if you're killing a deer or a cow or something, you just don't want the blood right there in your yard and you take it out and, and, and you bury it. And the Torah actually tells us another place to bury it, you know, don't leave it laying on the ground, just, but pour it out. Don't give it any, oh, this is the blood of the lamb, and don't do that. As soon as you put it in a blood and a bowl and give it any religious significance, you're sinning because you're in the wrong place and you're not, you know, it's not prescribed at all. It becomes a, a religious cultish thing don't do that you say you eat it eat the deers eat the cows eat the whatever cut them let the blood pour out don't in other words give it give it no more honor than you would water what was the next one 25 22. 22 thank you in the place Yahweh shall choose 21 to put his name there so they're talking about in Jerusalem then uh, let me back up one I got to get that in context Okay, so this is the same context. Verse 20 is where it starts. When Yahweh enlarges your border, your land that he's promised you, and you say to yourself, I want to eat some meat. Because that's what you want. You can eat the meat. Eat whatever you desire. If the place that Yahweh chooses to put his name is too far from you, you shall kill of the herd in your flock, which Yahweh's given you, as I've commanded, and eat it within your gates, all the desire of your soul. Now, so here's what he's saying. If, in other words, that's of the herd and of the flock. In other words, that wasn't... Uh, um, uh, yeah, it wasn't a wild animal. It wasn't a, a, a deer or a gazelle. That's a sheep or a goat or a cow. Something that could be sacrificed. And so essentially the rule is, if you're close enough to Jerusalem, you take it to Jerusalem. If you're outside the city, you go there and you sacrifice it to God. Then you eat it. Take it home and eat it. You give some to the Levites. Then you take the rest home and you eat it. Okay? But if you're so far away, you can't make it, and it's a lamb or sheep, a goat, uh, um, or cow, you know, something that would be, would be a sacrificial animal. That's what he's talking about. He said, so verse 21, if the place he, Yahweh chooses, and we know that's Jerusalem to put his name, is, is too far, then you shall kill of your herd, of your flock. These are, farm, these are regular animals. Again, not wild animals like Wayne's saying. And, the, and I've commanded you, and you may eat that in your gates all you want, just like, verse 22 is like, just like, even as, I'm saying just like, just like you would a gazelle or a deer, you just eat it. Once again, you don't have to be clean or unclean. Everybody can eat it. Your whole family can eat it. It doesn't matter if 
if you just came from a funeral or whatever, you can all eat it because it's not a sacrifice. He's making that point. He's just made a huge distinction because basically ever since they've come out of Egypt, pretty much everything they've killed has been a sacrifice because they've been in God's presence, you know, and so they're constantly sacrificing. And he's like, now, when you get, to Israel, when you get in the land, there's going to be Jerusalem. He don't use the word yet because they don't quite yet know where it is. He's going to show them. So sacrifice is there. When you're at home, you can eat pretty much, you can eat anything you want to, you know, that's, that's food. Alligators aren't food. Sorry. Okay. That makes sense? That help? Get it? Okay. What else? Yes. Uh, since the resurrection, uh, the Spirit of Christ is within us and our body is a holy temple. Well, we talked recently about like uh, not touching a dead person and going into the holy temple in Jerusalem because there the Messiah was and he's the living water. And we didn't want to contaminate the living water. Like that has to do with what we eat now. This appearance of Christ is within us, and we are a temple. Why is would it, we? We're not we? contaminating His spirit. <laughs> what is? How would you say? I would say exactly that. Why would we contaminate the temple of the Holy Spirit with things that are contrary to God's word? I think it's as simple as that. It has to do with relationship. Go ahead. Um, oh, there you um, go. Going back to the last, I think very simply, because we were talking about that this this, this morning, mm -hmm. it's really saying, uh, I'll just go to 2022. 20, mm -hmm. So you may eat them. The, and like you said earlier, you did touch that word, the unclean person and the clean person. It's not talking about the unclean food. No, and the distinction and is, again, think. he's distinguishing between, for the first time, He's distinguishing between eating things at your house and eating things at the temple in Jerusalem. Whereas the unclean, can't, unclean person, and, and that doesn't mean a bad person. That means just a person who's been exposed to something. That's Timmy. Like, that word, Timmy. And there's a Bible, there's a whole bunch of explanations for what Timmy is or unclean as a person. It's, a, it's, a stat, it's not a sin. It's just sometimes we go through things that leave us unclean. Um, so, yeah. So he's just making a distinction. Right, right, right. And, and good point, because they say unclean food, and there's no such thing as unclean food. If it's unclean, it is not food. Seriously, I mean, biblically, there's no such thing as unclean food. It's like do you, you, people ask, do you eat unclean food? There's no such thing. There's food, and there's unclean. Those two don't go together. There's two different things. There's what you can eat. That's food. And there's unclean. That's car batteries, tires, rattlesnakes, and gators. And barbecued armadillos and pigs. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Wayne. Well, when he said, and he gave those, the Torahs on that, what was clean and unclean, uh -huh. he, his, his, he said at the end of it, and you will not defile yourself with these things right. because right. I am holy and that's where we started yep. and, uh, and that was why well and that's key if, it is if we are saying that we're going to invite him into our, our, our holy of holies which uh -huh. is our heart, heart. Yep. then who wants to be a slum landlord there who wants it. to bring God into an unclean neighborhood that's right. an unclean place we're, so uh, it, it, it's the significance of why should we defile ourselves is right there. Right there, yeah. It's because he wants us set apart. And, you know, and I, I know we all grew up in the South, most of us. And um, I certainly did. I grew up on a farm. So I pretty much ate anything that didn't eat me first. And if it tried to eat me, I was going to try to eat it all much faster. That would just make me mad. And they're like, oh, I'm really going to eat you now. <laughs> you done bit me. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so, but yeah, I mean, and, and that, you know, the, the sin of that ignorance, you know, God winks at that. But um, also when we realize that he's, how we treat our body is, is important to God because it is his temple. It is, uh, you know, where his spirit resides. And so we want to have a good testimony, you know, uh, and, and health and blessings is part of that. Um, I mean, we do live in a broken, fallen world, so life happens. You know, because it says thorns and thistles. And by the way, it's not supposed, gentlemen, it's not supposed to be easy. Like, why isn't it easy? It's thorns and thistles. Sweat of your brow. It is not supposed to be easy. 
but I've sure learned that it's a whole lot easier if I do it Yah's way instead of my way. Now that, that's just a road to destruction. Every time I think I'm getting going, I hit a brick wall or like solid concrete like that one, and you just like, it don't move. You know, it's like, whoa, okay, regroup, start again. Yes? I read one time about clean and unclean, and the Father made this comment in the Torah. He said, we're talking about why, we, why would you take something that would make you unclean? He mm -hmm. said, why should you die unclean? And it's, it's a serious issue that, that we maintain cleanliness. Yeah, we don't know. We don't, we don't know when <laughs> we're going to take our last breath. I mean, I'm absolutely positive my friend Roger had no idea he was about to die because, like I say, he's real healthy for that moment and you know in a lot of situations but why would we walk around unclean I mean take it back to relationship exactly. even exactly. if you if you if he's living in here you want him to live in here why would you pour that stuff in there you know go ahead I was wondering remember a couple of Sabbaths back we were uh, covered that portion where are we we covered the topic of uh, well, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Haven't we done all these wonderful things in your name? And he said, get away from me, you doers of iniquity. I never knew you. I wonder if you took today's lesson and changed the beginning to that, if these would not be clues as to who that may be. Say, that last, say that last line again. If, if today's sermon that you did, yeah. instead of staying starting at... Uh, I am holy, right, so therefore right, you be right. holy. Put up there, you doers of iniquity, I never knew you. Yeah. And all the examples that you gave yeah. today, if that would be clues as to who that might be. No doubt. I think no doubt, because we got one way in the back, back row. <clears throat> um, you know, uh, we're, we're being called, it's, this really hasn't been taught what we're, you know, there's no big charismatic leader behind what we're teaching. It, I've been doing it for a really long time, but, you know, when he first came here, there was only a few people. Now there's hundreds and hundreds of people and, and uh, teaching it. And, uh, and it's, I think it's the Holy Spirit just bring, getting us ready. It's like we need to step up our game. We need to step up our spiritual game and quit making it about us and start making it about Him. That's really what the Torah is about. Quit, quit making it about us, which is just our Western mindset, and let's make it about Him. And when it becomes about Him and a relationship with Him, it shifts your whole, it shifts your whole mind, your whole attitude. Yes, Chris. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I thought, yeah. I thought you had it. Um, I, I do have a question. Okay. Um, this has a little bit more to do with um, more of just Torah in general. Okay. So... Um, because you were saying in Colossians that we're forgiven through Yeshua, mm -hmm. but isn't that only through repentance too? We have to repent for the sins that we commit because we all fall short of the glory of God. Say that, say that last part one more time. It's a little bit of an echo up here, so it's just hard to hear. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, actually, there's a lot of echo up here. But yeah, it's, it's been. Yeah. Um, because, because we all are not perfect and we all fall short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. um, we all sin at some point or another, but you were saying that um, we're forgiven through Yeshua, but that is also through our repentance of, of, a, of apologizing, essentially, for falling short. That, um, so it's not just that he had died and now we're free and clear, we have to also Repent. So, so yeah, yeah, I hear you now. Okay. Yeah. Say that again, Chris. Yeah. So yeah, so um, the Bible describes two different things. Um, it describes a process called sanctification and it describes something called justification. Justification is what we say is just as if I'd never sinned. So that's our status. Our status with God is clean. Yes, and that's what happened at the cross. That's our, like, Lord, I accept your death, burial, and resurrection. I accept, you know, your payment for sin for my life. That's status. We move into that status. 
Unfortunately, our walk hasn't quite measured up. Our day-to-day -day walk is kind of in a different place. I'm going to bounce this off the wall and see if it helps. Sometimes it does. Um, and so that process, so the status and process, that process is called sanctification. The process of sanctification. It actually uses a very similar language to that in the book of Romans in one place. Um, and so, the, yes, so when, once we have the status of forgiveness and, and uh, you know, being sanctified, there's actually a verse in the King James, I think it says, you were sanctified while we are being sanctified. It's something to that effect. Um, so we have this status, but our process, in the process, when we do sin, what we do is recognize the sin, take responsibility for it, and repent for it, and, you know, turn away from it and be restored, you know, so we get that restoration. So we have that ongoing process that we do continually to stay in that, that our walk stays as close to our status as we can make it. And so it's a daily process. I mean, the Bible describes that quite a bit. Um, and so, yeah, that, that, that daily, daily, daily walk. And I tell people, keep your account short with God. You know, it's like, it's real easy. It's like, well, I'll, oh, yeah, I know I did that. Yeah, I know I did that. And pretty soon you're dragging on a bunch of luggage and, you know, like, why are you dragging that stuff, man? Repent for it. Get rid of it. Because that's really where we give the devil permission to operate in our lives. When we're dragging around sins that we haven't repented for, it becomes a permission slip for the enemy, literally, to say, hey, it says right here, if they do this, basically that I can do that. And they haven't repented. And here he goes. We've just wrote him a permission slip. But hopefully by a while he's on the way, he's like, dear Lord, I am so sorry. Da, 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 da. Like, oh. This guy's just not going to let me come there. Is he? That's really the permission slip we give the enemy. So keep those accounts short. Keep, his, keep him done. Amen?